You got to know what the room is when you walk into it and how to approach whoever that is. You enter his gates with thanksgiving. Then you enter his courts with praise. Then you got to tell him how great he is. Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. But the Bible says that Jesus, when he left the earth, went back to heaven and he forever makes intercessions for us. So in other words, here I am, and there the Heavenly Father is, and Jesus is our intercessor. He's the go-between. And you do him just like you did while I was with you. He said, whatever you ask in my name, my Father will give you. Whatever you ask in my name, my Father will give you. We've talked about those scriptures. And we've talked about many, many others. I just, uh, I'm so grateful that you're here today. And uh, I'm so grateful that I get a few minutes to share the word of the Lord with you. I'm especially excited about this message. <laughs> like, yeah, we've heard that before, Pastor. Where well, are you going to keep on hearing it? Uh, I don't ever think you want me to have a day where I get up here and I'm not excited about the message. I'm really excited about this message because um, it's not something that took a lot of exegetical expertise where I had to break down word studies at... It's, it's really something where God just wanted me to prove a point. I want to talk about familiarity, the miracle killer. It is a part of prayology. Um, actually, I thought about taking this and making it a part of the next series, but I really feel impressed to the Lord that I'm supposed to speak it right now. And uh, for the last couple of days, he's been burning a few scriptures in my heart, and I've just been reading over them and meditating them and not really breaking them down, but just want to present those stories to you to show you uh, how familiarity can become the death knell of so many things. So if you're visiting with us, God bless you. If you got saved today, you just made the best decision you've ever made. And everybody else under the roof and everybody that is with us virtually, I hope you are enjoying being a part of our redemption family today. We're so excited about you. I was in Gmail, which is a prayer series for many, many weeks. They felt like in the marketing department, we need to, hey, even though you're going to keep praying along, uh, teaching along the lines of prayer, that we need to maybe change it up. So this is just an extension of Gmail, kind of like Gmail volume two. But we've been talking about prayer. <clears throat> Much teaching has been done. And today, I don't really want to do any uh, review, so to speak. Uh, last uh, few times, we've been talking about, you know, basically the prayer of faith. We've been talking about the prayer of agreement. Uh, we've been talking about the power of anticipation and expectation and all these things that may not be directly a prayer, but they're things that have to do with prayer being effective. Let me say that again. <laughs> so some of the things I've been teaching the last two weeks are not actually a prayer, so to speak, but they are things that have to be involved in your prayer life if your prayer life is going to work. And so today is like that. Familiarity, the miracle killer. Um, while he plays, I just want to speak to you a moment. You know, <clears throat> how do you maintain your passion? You know, I used to have older generation when I was a young preacher, they'd throw me those zingers. You know, I thought I'd done something good and you know, they kind of say something that puts you back in your place and brings you down to earth. And I'm kind of that age now. Had somebody not too long ago, really young, did a great job, just did a great job and came up to me, said, how do we do? I said, man, that was really, really good. I saw a big smile come across the face. Then I, after the exhortation, I came with the challenge. I said, but the question, <coughs> is not, can you take the Word of God and move a crowd one time? The question is, can you do it three or four times a week for 40 years? Of course, there was silence, just like there's silence right now. I always tell you, the baseball player, it's not can he hit a home run one time, it's can he maintain the passion for the game to keep developing himself. I watched the last dance with Michael Jordan and he talked about how he got older. He had to rearrange his game where he played more with his mind than he did his physical abilities. What does that mean? Maintaining your passion over a long period of time is one of the key indicators that God is about to birth greatness. There's a lot of people that start off hot and then they fizzle out. 
But how is it you maintain your passion in a marriage? Because familiarity in a marriage is a marriage killer. How is it you remain and maintain your passion about your church, about your church leadership, and you don't come in one day and say, oh, I've been here 18 years, I've kind of heard everything they've got to say, nothing new to me. How do you keep that from setting in? Because ingratitude is the first step toward backsliding. When you come in and all of a sudden you expect it instead of being grateful for it. I feel like I'm hitting something already. And we grow familiar with it. When we grow familiar, the gratitude for it begins to seep out and then we lose, the thing loses its honor. So we no longer honor the person we were dating after we got married because we've grown familiar and we know their sleep habits and we've sensed the loss, we, they, we sense that all the adventure is gone and there's nothing else to learn about the person. So familiarity sets in and the relationship begins to die. The church being able to bless you begins to die. The pastor being able to impact you begins to die. Your prayer life begins to die. You can't maintain the business because your passion to do it begins to die. When you lose your passion for it, it goes down with you because it was your passion that was sustaining it. When familiarity gets in, it creeps in the little cracks of a thing and you have to be aware of it because you're the one in charge of keeping it out of your life and out of your relationships. I wanna prove my point here in the next few minutes and I think you'll see some places where maybe we need to close the door to familiarity here as I'm reading these scriptures, hallelujah. First one I wanna read is Mark 6, verses one through six. Mark chapter six, verses one through six. Let's look at this on the screen together. Then he went out from there and came to his own country. Came to his own country. Now if there's ever a time you wanna do good, it's when you're at home. If there was ever a time at my high school I wanted to score a touchdown, it was when I was playing for the home crowd. If there was ever a time I wanted to dunk the ball, it was when I knew my dad was in the stands and I was playing before my hometown. Whenever you're coming into your hometown, because of your love for it, you want to do well. So Jesus, he had all these signs and wonders and miracles that were happening everywhere he went. And finally he gets to take that anointing and the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit back to his own town, to the people that he loved. And his disciples followed in verse two. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue and many hearing him were astonished saying, where did this man get these things and with what wisdom to which has been given him that such mighty works are performed by the power of his hands? Is this not, oh, here we go. Is this not the carpenter? There's nothing special about this guy. We know Jesus. We saw his mom changing his diaper and bathing him. We saw him running through the streets of Galilee. We know his family. He helps his dad out in his carpenter shop. This isn't, this isn't any Messiah, this is Joseph's boy. The son of Mary, the brother of James, who says, Judas, Simon, <laughs> are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. Oh, there's so much I want to tell you right here. Right, let me wait. Let me wait and read it first. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there except he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about villages in a circuit teaching. Go back to verse four and sit right there. Father, bless the reading of your word. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Tell your neighbor on both sides. Here we go, here we go. This is not deep, but is extremely confrontational and challenging. But I'm ready to see power come back to your spiritual life and your prayer life, amen? But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. Let me go back to verse three. Let me go back to verse three, if you would. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? Immediately, I taught you a few Sundays ago 
that you receive someone the way you perceive them. I was talking about expectation. And the woman who was at the well, Jesus could not make a breakthrough. Jesus could not bless her. Jesus could not make up any ground with her because she kept seeing him as just a Jewish man who didn't like Samaritans. He did. He was at a well. He was thirsty. He had nothing to draw with. And it was all about natural things. And Jesus knew he had to go through there. He knew that woman was his assignment, but he had to change her perception of him. He said, if you knew who was ta- you were talking to, you would ask him and he would give you living water. And here she comes again, you know, kind of mouthy. Well, if you tell me where this water is and certainly I'll drink it so I don't have to keep coming back here. Uh, Sir, the well is deep. You have nothing to draw with. You Jews don't even like us Samaritans until you need I mean, just so Jesus said, go call your husband. He shifted her perception when he began to prophetically look into the life of a woman that he had no natural knowledge of. And she said, sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. And then once she saw him as a prophet, the door was open for him to be a prophet to her. Come on, somebody. If you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. If you receive a righteous man in the name of a righteous man, you receive a righteous man's reward. So if I will embrace you and perceive you and receive you as God has sent you, then I get the reward that God has put in you that can change my life. If God has asked you to be a prophet to me, you can only be a, you can only bless me if I receive you as that. You can be a anointed as that, but unless I see you as anointed as that, you don't have the power to bless me. And Jesus was the same Jesus walking into his hometown that he was in Jericho, that he was in Bethsaida, that he was in Bethany, every other town he'd been in, Jerusalem, he was the same Jesus, same anointing, same power, same ability to do miracles. But when he got to his hometown, even though he was the Messiah, they did not see him as the Messiah. I have to receive a prophet in the name of a prophet to receive a prophet's reward. So I've got to be able to receive you as God sent you to be able to get the thing that God packaged in you to bless my life. Oh, I'm preaching. Thank you, Lord Jesus. These are not deep concepts, but they're challenging concepts. How many times has God sent you miracles wrapped up in people that are all around you, wrapped up in the voice of your child, but you wouldn't receive them, wrapped up in the voice of a wife or a a husband that you've grown familiar with and you wouldn't receive them, wrapped up in the voice of somebody walking across the parking lot at the grocery store, and because you didn't see them as a carrier or a messenger of God, because you didn't see them as a prophet of God, you missed something God had put in their life that was supposed to bless you. Let me tell you something. Everybody under the sound of my voice is anointed. Everybody under the sound of my voice has the Spirit of God living on the inside of them. And I have to understand that if I pray for a blessing, God's going to send you. If I pray for increase, God's going to send you. If I pray for favor, God's going to send you. If you pray for deliverance and pray for healing and a man or a woman of God shows up, God answered your prayer. But can you receive them the way God sent? them because they can't bless you until you see them that way high five three people in this building and said you gotta see me right come on you gotta see me right oh I feel an anointing shifting in this building you was waiting for Jesus to walk through holding a lamb with a white garment and hair coming down the back of his neck but the fact is when so and so walked up to you that was Jesus when Larry walked up to you that was Jesus come on when Ray Ray walked up to you that was Jesus when Sarah Lee walked up to you that was Jesus you got to understand Jesus we are the body of the anointing the anointing rests in the people all around you and your miracle is locked up in somebody else and you've got to see them for that to unlock it shout hallelujah shout hallelujah somebody shout I see it I see it I see it I receive it. Tell somebody else on both sides, I receive you. I receive you. I receive you. Hey! Come on, we got to go deeper. We got to go deeper. We got to go deeper. I feel the Spirit of God in this place. I feel the Spirit of God in this place. Hey, hallelujah. So, is this not the carpenter and we got his sisters, his brothers here, verse 4. 
A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and among his own relatives. The difficult thing is sometimes it's the people closest to you that have the most difficult time believing in you. Why is that? It don't mean they're bad people. But when you know somebody's flaws, it is difficult to see greatness. The kingdom works this way. He buries treasures in a field, the Bible says. The treasures are hidden in the field. A field is dirt. God hides great things behind dirty things. And then he calls on you to excavate the dirt. So I've got to understand how it works for a miner and an excavator. They understand that you have to move a ton of dirt to get an ounce of gold. And so we've got to understand with people to get the treasure that God's trying to send you. I've got to be able to know the dirt and know the flaws and still believe God can use you anyway. I told you this was not deep, but this is extremely challenging. Because people can believe in somebody till they find out they're not perfect and find out what's wrong with them. Then we lose respect and then that person can no longer bless you. Not because they've lost their anointing, but because you've lost your honor for them. I'm preaching. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for giving me this message. Thank you, Lord. Look at your neighbor right now. Just look at him and say, he's preaching. My pastor's preaching today. Okay. Can I go deeper? Jesus says a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. I remember my father. (laughs) <laughs> it's, it's, it's still a story to this day that we'll joke about around the Thanksgiving table and other things. You know, my dad knew me. My dad knew I was mis- mis- mischievous and how cantankerous I could be. And he, he knew the friends I hang out with. He remembers the time I skipped school and he had to grind. I mean, he, he remembers the car wrecks. He remembers everything. <clears throat> so I came home after my freshman year in college and announced to my father, he was sitting in a recliner reading the newspaper. And I announced to him that I had given my heart to Jesus and I felt called to the ministry. Let me tell you something. I remember my dad did not even drop the newspaper. <laughs> he literally held it up over his face and kept reading it. Why? Because he was a bad dad. Let me tell you, my dad was the greatest man I've ever known. But why is it? I want to see the fruit of this before I get excited about it. The fact is the people in his hometown were just that, people in his hometown. And it happened to be his relatives. And it's hard when you watch somebody you grew up in that same house, when God chooses them and picks them out to rise and wants to take them for greatness, yet you know everything displeasurable about them. That's what Jesus was running into. Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, but they pulled him down to the natural. In other words, they disregarded the spiritual assignment so that they could be familiar with him as one of his, their, as, as their brother, as the carpenter's boy, as Mary's son. They wanted to bring him down. And when they brought him down out of perceiving him spiritually and made him common, Mm. Thank you, Lord. I just got bombs going off inside of me right now. When they made him common, look, look, the power of Jesus could not work. Not because Jesus walked into Nazareth and lost his power, but because they did not receive him as a Messiah. So what you receive in life from people of God is directly in parallel to how you perceive them in the spirit. If you don't think somebody's anointed, their anointing won't bless you. If you don't think somebody's great, their greatness won't bless you. If you don't think somebody's unique, their uniqueness won't bless you. I remember back when our church 
uh, redemption really started exploding, started breaking cultural barriers, and God was doing just a, a miraculous thing that had never been done before in the Deep South. And I remember that all of a sudden we really began to gain in popularity, and certain <clears throat> TV shows immediately had me coming in about every week now and, and hosting shows and visiting shows and speaking on the shows and doing fundraising on the shows. And I had a great mentor in my life at that time who saw a pattern beginning to develop. And he took me to the side and he told me this. He said, don't you let them make you common. One of the most valuable lessons I've ever learned. Because when you're just coming on the scene, what do you do? You say yes to everything. And then all of a sudden, what happens? They're so used to seeing your face, they just get familiar and they keep turning the channel. Why? Because when you have the perception by the people that you are common, it is difficult for those people that you think are common to bless your life, even though God may have packaged greatness on the inside of them. So he could do no mighty work in his hometown. He went back in the place he wanted to demonstrate the greatest level and dimension of power and breakthrough was the only place that he could do nothing. Not because there was a change in Jesus, but because there was a change in reception. The honor got lost in the familiarity. They made him familiar and a prophet had no honor in his hometown. And when you do not honor the gift that God sends to you, you cannot receive the gift that God meant for you to have. Somebody shout hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, my pastor is preaching. Hey! <laughs> Can I keep going? Two more examples. I've took a, too much time with the first one. Let me hit you with two more examples. <laughs> okay? Luke chapter 7. I got about nine scriptures here. <laughs> Luke chapter 7. <clears throat> Pardon me. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down. Now, that should have never happened. This is Hebrew, this is a Pharisee. Jesus walked straight in the house and Jesus sits straight down. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping and she began to wash his feet with her tears, wiped them with the hairs of her head, kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. Next verse. Now the Pharisee who had invited him saw this. He spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is touching him for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors, one of 500 denarii, the other 50. And when they had nothing which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, which one of them will love him more? Simon said, I suppose the one who, had, who he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said, and said to Simon, do you see this woman? He said, I entered your house and you gave me no water but she washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Verse 45, you gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, <laughs> the same loves little. Verse 48, then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Verse 49, and they sat at the table and began to say, who is this that even forgives sins. They said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. We went through that quick. Stay with me. Ah, hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Okay. A common, a commoner, a anybody in Hebrew tradition, when they had come off a journey they would be greeted with a holy kiss. Their feet would be washed and their head would be anointed. Jesus is with Simon and Jesus is with the disciples, but they've been with him three and a half years. <laughs> He's no longer special. He's no longer a big deal to be around. They've grown familiar with him. They've heard his teachings. They've seen his power. No big deal. 
We've been, you know, when we met him, it was one thing, but after three and a half years, we've kind of gotten used to all this discipleship stuff. We know Jesus, no big deal. We used to go through all the motions, but now just bring him in and let him sit down. Jesus, the son of God, did not even get the benefit of a common greeting in a Hebrew house. No benefit. I mean, he did not get what anybody, I mean, a cousin, somebody who's working with you, somebody who's come to visit you. He didn't get any of that. So sometime, what does Jesus do? Jesus will mess church people up because church people get familiar with God. I've been in church now, you know, 20 years, so everybody else, I see all those young people up there jumping around and bouncing around, but you know, I don't, they don't take all that. I don't need to do it anymore. I'm going to tell you something. If you start back jumping around, you might have something released in your life that hasn't been released since the last time you jumped around. Don't you ever despise the day of someone who has just met Jesus or young in their faith, the exuberance and the zeal they had for when David backslid and sent against God with adultery with Bathsheba and then killing her husband. You know what he said? He said, God forgive me and return me to my first love. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. And sometimes church people we get so familiar with prayer that prayer has been what Matthew 7 calls vain repetition. It has no power. We just go through the motions. We just do it. We just show up. We just listen to a message. The message don't impact us and we just see people and we don't see nothing great in them and we've just become familiar with everything well have you noticed there's not been much breakthrough in your life come on I'm gonna say it can you notice there hadn't been many miracles in your life why it's because you're so familiar with everything and we've lost the honor that we have for God that that God is no longer moving in our midst the devil is a lie I'm gonna shame it now and I'm gonna pull down the familiarity now and in the name of Jesus I believe there's a culture of honor was being established where we once again honor God and we once again honor the God that is in each other. Somebody shout hallelujah in this place. I feel a breakthrough by the power of the Holy Ghost. God is about to break forth in miracles but it's not going to come out of the sky. It's going to come out of the people that are sitting around you. Shout yes. Shout yes. Mm. Yay! Hallelujah! You got to quit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, Jesus let a sinner come in. Leave it to God to let the sinners come in and ruffle all the feathers of the church folk. So a sinner who come in who had a past as long as an interstate came in the house where nobody kissed him, nobody washed his feet, nobody anointed his head. When Jesus gets familiar with the church people, he will bring somebody else in who loves him much to shame them. And here comes the woman with the alabaster box and another account of this story. It says a year's wage. This woman worked an unholy job that robs you of your soul for that money. And now it was a year's worth and broke it across his feet. Breaking the power of the familiar that is in the boys' club room. And in came a woman to say, I'm going to take the most valuable thing I got and smash it and let it run all over his feet and let the ointment and perfume fill the whole room. And for people who have gotten so familiar, they wouldn't even wash his feet. <laughs> 
when he came in, I'm not going to take a towel and a basin of water. I'm going to take my tears and I'm going to take my hair and I'm going to clean his feet. Why? Because those who have been forgiven little, love little. Those who've been forgiven much, loveth much. I wish somebody would go back to just how far God reached to get you. Some of you have forgot what kind of person you were. Some of you are no longer grateful for the grace of God. We've done moved on to blessings and we're believing for business and we believe in God for houses. When's the last time you got out of bed and before your feet hit the floor, you said, I thank you that I'm saved. I thank you that I have breath in my lungs. I thank you that I've been washed in the blood of the lamb. I thank you that the Holy Spirit leaves in me and I will never again be alone. When's the last time you just began to thank God, not for stuff, but because of his presence who got up with you and who went to sleep with you that night? Come on, somebody. I need to, I need to break the power of familiarity. I I tell you we are coming into a season where God is releasing the miraculous. I'm seeing an uptick and an increase in testimonies. We had somebody two weeks ago healed of stage four cancer and they can't even find the cancer in the body. Diagnosed at one doctor meeting, can't even find it at the next doctor meeting. Things are happening. We had two people on the west coast that got prophesied after a prophecy went forth that there'd be 24 hour money miracles and two unbelievable turnarounds happen in the same family in the next 24 hours. There are things that are breaking out. There are things that are happening. We went from 400 salvations a week to let's believe for 500 then 500 to 600 then 600 to 700. Last week there were 735 people saved through everything called redemption. I'm telling you there is a God in heaven that's wanting to break out but we've got to do away, away, away with the familiarity with church and with praise and with prayer and with worship and with God's people. We got to do away with the familiarity that's robbing us of the essence of God's power and put honor back in our hearts for God and one another because I want to see God move in our midst again. Shout hallelujah. Jesus. Oh. Let me. I don't have time for this one. Play something if you would, please. I'm just, I'm going to start landing this plane because I feel an anointing here to repent. <laughs> Had our youth pastor ask me, he said, what are you preaching? Asked me last night. And I said, it's going to be very confrontational. And you know what? People don't want messages that take them to a place of repentance. They want to be prayed for. They want hands laid on them. They want a blessing to come. They want a healing to manifest. But sometimes you need to come up and fall on your face and say, God, I repent because your word has just hit me right between the eyes and has pierced my heart. <laughs> Those of you that live in regions where church and churchianity and faith is common, you especially have to be on alert. Where you volunteer and you kind of really don't even go into service anymore because I, you know, I kind of know what they do. When was the last time you cried during worship? When's the last time you did something other than stand there and clap? When's the last time you prayed a hole through the ceiling? instead of sounding like you were saying a 30-year-old blessing. I don't know. Pastor, why can't you just be nice? You're so confrontational. Yes, because there's something I want to see. And I believe God is releasing the keys to it. In Malachi 1, I'm not going to read it. But God said, if I am a father, where is my honor? And God is supposed to get the spotless lambs and the first of the flocks and the first fruits of the harvest. And they're bringing God leftovers. And God is upset. That's the two chapters later, he talks about the tithe and offering and being robbed. Well, in chapter one, he talks about honor. He said, if I am a father, if I'm your God, where is my honor? And he said, would your governor accept this stuff? He said, try giving it to somebody else. He said, they won't even accept it. He says, you're not bringing me the first. He said, you're bringing me the last. 
And basically what God is telling them, go read it. It's, it's a tough chapter. Malachi 1, he says, basically, if it don't mean anything to you, it don't mean anything to me. I got millionaires sitting under the sound of my voice that threw a $10 bill in and offering. Can I tell you something? If it doesn't mean anything to you, David said, I will give nothing to the Lord that doesn't cost me. And he gave the biggest offering to build the temple of God to date. <laughs> and God said to them, he said, I would that the priest would shut the doors. He said, if you're going through the motions and there's no high regard and honor for your God, he said, there's no power. It's all doubly dead and dried up at the roots. It's clouds with no water. It's a form of godliness with no power. He said, shut the whole thing down. And then he ends out by saying, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? The people who don't know God. And then that's where that scripture comes that we sing from the rising of the sun, from the going down of the same, the name of the Lord shall be great. A non-believer should see your praise and know how great your God is. A non-believer should see you worship and say, I don't know their God, but he must be a great God. A non-believer should see your sacrificial giving and say, I do not know the God they're giving to, but he must be a great God. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord shall be great. Is that name still great to you? I'm gonna ask Pastor Matt if he would. I'm gonna ask Pastor Robert, Pastor Ashley, say, who are all these pastors? This is, our ministry now is cast all over the world, East Coast to West Coast in America and all over the world like a net. And we have people with pastoral shepherding gifts here to shepherd you in this moment. I'm about to get out of the way and I want them to come up and begin to take the people of God into a prayer of repentance. What is a prayer of repentance? I don't mean people come up and the pastor's gonna pray for you. I mean, you come up and kneel before God and say, God, he's talking about me. He's talking about me. I've gotten familiar with everything and you know what? I haven't experienced your power in a long time. Familiarity is the miracle killer. I wish there would be some people under the sound of my voice that you become the woman with the box and say whether anyone else praises or worships them or not, I'm going to come up and break my box. Worship needs to ring out in this building and people need to come before God and pour out their hearts and get up and change your life and change the culture of who we are. Go ahead and lead as God directs you.